We talk about being courageous. We talk about the bravery of different individuals that have been brave and have shown courage in the face of absolute danger. The other night I was watching the news and it was telling of a, of a man who was in his mid to late 50s. He had spent his life protecting celebrities. And after the invasion by Hamas into Israel a couple Sundays ago, he decided that he needed to go to Israel, that he needed to defend his people. And so at 50 some odd years old, he went back. And they asked him in this question, why? Why? And he said, because of the cowards that took the life of women and babies. He said, it does not take courage on my part. But he said, it would be an act of cowardice if I did not rally to the army in defense of my people. See, the man had a Jewish heritage. And so the questioner who was interviewing him kept pushing him, wanting to say how much courage it took. The man would not want to do that. He basically talked about responsibility. He talked about what kind of person he would be if he did not set aside everything. And the woman even asked him, well, you've laid it all on the line. And he goes, no. He said, when this is over, I'm going to come back to America and I'll pick right back up where I left off. He said, I am an American citizen, but my heritage is Jewish. Well, what about our heritage? What kind of heritage do we have? We talked this morning about, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We have a heritage. We are children of God. And we have to do everything to not only defend, but we have to advance the cause of Christ. Appreciated the song Sam led. Because they again come back and resonate to talk about spreading it. And even though we are few in number, we think back to the day of Pentecost. And there were 11. By that time, Simon had committed suicide. 11 of them. Go and be my, be my witnesses. Spread the gospel to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. Daunting. Daunting to be sure. But in Deuteronomy, the 31st chapter, and verse 6, great passage. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. I realize that was spoken to the children of Israel. I understand that. But I think it applies to us as well. And I think it applies to people, God's people down through the ages. Oh, we're not physically going out to conquer other people. But yet we still have adversaries. And we still need to be of good courage and hold on to that courage and be mindful of it. Be courageous. I love the picture of this little boy. Nothing's going to harm him. He's got his official cape and his mask on. He's invincible. Well, if we look at Ephesians, the sixth chapter, and we take on the whole panoply of God. 
In a sense, we are invincible as well. We have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. When our boys were little, Linda made a cape and made a head covering, kind of like Batman. And Micah, he would don that and he'd run around the house like a Tasmanian devil. Nothing was going to harm him. Not a thing. He'd run into walls, boing, 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 get back up and tear off again. Oh, to have that kind of courage. Well, as Christians, we're called upon to have that kind of courage. In the book of Romans in the 8th chapter, we find that because we are a child of God, no one, no one stacks up to us. And that's not arrogance or braggadocia, but we have nothing to fear. But we can be of good courage because we are children of God. Look at the 8th chapter of Romans. We're going to look at a couple passages. Romans 8, 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? If we've got God on our side, we've already won. 37. In verse 37. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. We've already won. See how great a love the Father has for us? That we should be called children of God? That's 1 John 3, verse 1. I am, you are, a child of the God of heaven. It takes courage. And it takes a heart of courage. Like we talked about this morning. But as children of God, we have it. And so we have nothing to fear. Be of good courage. I love this picture. I saw it. And I'm a like, boy. It's like deer in the headlights. But sometimes that's the way we are. We, we get afraid. But we're told, fear not. Because I can do all things. Through him who strengthens me. I don't fear. I don't fear. God provides me the strength. And I know it. And I can hold up under all of that. In Isaiah, the 40th chapter, talks about mount up on wings of eagles. You're going to win. But you have to have the courage. But the passage I want us to look at is the one found in 2 Corinthians. And in 2 Corinthians, go into the 12th chapter. Chapter we don't look at very often. But I want you to go down to verse 9. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 9. And he has said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weakness, that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weakness, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I'm strong. His grace is sufficient. It is powerful. It is directed. So I, what do I fear? I mean, we can, we can conquer. We can rise above. Because we are children of God. We have a relationship with God through his son, Jesus, who is the Christ. We spent a good part of this morning talking about who Jesus is, 
his relationship to deity. And when you look at the scriptures, you see you cannot separate Jesus from being divine. He was declared with power to be the Son of God when God the Father resurrected him from the dead. And sometimes we trip over the word God. We get, we get all tangled up. But we're talking about deity. Divine entity. Of which there are, according to the scriptures, three. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Deity. And we fear not because we have a relationship with Christ. Gives us courage. Linda's brother, Norm, had a reputation in the town where he grew up. And after I met Linda, I went down to that same city. And there were some people that... Um, decided that for whatever reason, they did not care for me. And I was a little bit intimidated. And so I asked Norm, I said, hey, Norm, can you come over and spend a few days at the house? And he said, sure. When these people pulled up in the driveway, I said, hey, Norm, you want to come out with me? And let's go visit with these people. And then said, sure. We went out. All they had to do was they looked and saw Norm there. They got in their cars. They drove away. And they never bothered me again. I told Norm years later what the deal was. He thought I was just asking him to come over and have fun at the house. But I wanted people to see that I had a relationship with Norm, who had a reputation. We have a relationship with Christ, who has a very positive reputation. And his grace is sufficient for us. We can be victorious, no matter what we face. Be courageous. Remember, you're doing God's will. We're about the work that God would have us and want us to do. Look at Philippians, the second chapter, verse 13. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. We become an instrument, a vessel for the God of heaven, is what we become. And we do it. We do that work from the heart. Go back into the book of 1 Peter. In 1 Peter, I want you to go into chapter 4 and drop down with me into verse 2. Actually, let's start in 1. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same purpose. Because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the flesh of men, excuse me, the lust of men, but for the will of God. We're going to be doing the will of God. We need to hold on to that. We need to gain strength and courage because of all the things I've said before. And then to realize you're doing something that is noble, that is absolutely noble. And it is advancing the borders of Christ's kingdom. Now go back to that man that I was talking about who is leaving behind his work, his job here, if you would. Gone back to Israel. Donned the uniform of the IDF. And what he said was, it is a noble cause. I can't sit by and watch children 
babies be beheaded, torn in two. I cannot watch women be brutalized and do nothing. It is a noble thing that I'm trying to do to stop them from repeating it. I'm trying to stop them. What are we trying to do? Now, I'm not talking about armed insurrection or defense. That's not. I'm using it as an illustration. But we realize that Satan works. Are we doing what we can to stop his advancement? And I'm talking in a spiritual sense. Are we taking the message of the gospel to those lost in sin? You're lost. You need to turn to Christ in a way consistent with the word found in the scriptures. That's what we long to do. That's what Peter's talking about here. We can do God's will. We can be about his work. Because you know what? We have nothing to fear. We have the sword of the Spirit. Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter, verse 29, talks about the word being like a fire and like a stone. And that's what we got. We have that. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. We've got it. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. People state any number of things that try to diminish the power of God's word. There is nothing more powerful than the word of God. There is nothing that is in a physical sense that has ever been created whereby the salvation of souls is seen. The only thing that is powerful enough for the redemption of mankind is the blood of Christ, found explained in the Word of God. I'm reading a kind of a lighthearted book now, and uh, it's chronicling a maid. And she talks about the joy she finds in cleaning and orderly fashion. And how she works so hard to get out the spots. And the type of cleaner that she uses to eradicate the spots. And what joy she finds once the spots are gone. Talking about she has power over the filth and grime that's found in the the world. Well, when it comes to the spiritual side the power that cleans the filth is God's word. And when we're in spiritual conflict, we have the most powerful tool ever, the word of God. Look at Hebrews 4th chapter, verse 12. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of the soul and spirit, both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Now I want you to just stop for a second on the soul and spirit. Because a lot of times we have a hard time differentiating between the soul and spirit. And those two words are represented by Greek words, psyche and pneuma. One part directed toward man, one part directed toward God. But the word of God is sharp enough to incise the division of of those two things. I'm, I'm sure some of you, if not all of you, took biology. And you had to incise a frog or something. 
and you took hold of a scalpel and you made the cut. I couldn't make the cut when I was trying to be in med school. Well, you got to work on a cadaver. Hey, no. Even though that individual was lifeless, was dead. Once I took it in my hands, I couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. But I would watch other students carefully cut, cut, sharp. Able to cut deeper and deeper, finer and finer. The Word of God is so able to incise, to cut that which we can't even see. So if the Word of God is able to do that, what do I have to fear? It is so powerful, so dramatically powerful. And so I look at it and I go, okay, gives me another reason why I can be of good courage. And it also tells me I can be strong because there is a way of escape. I don't know how many of you have gone to escape rooms. I think that would be fun to look at the clues and try to figure out how to get out of the room. I think it'd be great. And uh, the way life is going, who wants to get out? You just got to come back into the real world. But I speak tongue in cheek. But I do. But spiritually speaking, there is a way of escape. I can be courageous. Encourage in that. That there is a way in this life to escape. Look at Psalms 140, uh, Psalms 124, 7. You can see it on the overhead. Our soul has escaped as a bird out of the snare of the trapper. The snare is broken. We have escaped. When Christ died on the cross, he set us free. How wonderful. How blessed that is. Second Peter 2.9 And the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation to keep the righteous under punishment for the day of judgment. Focus on the top part. The Lord knows how to rescue the godly. Again, in the news, what are they talking about? Talking about roughly 200 people that have been taken hostage. They don't know where they are. Maybe they're in the infamous tunnels. And it would be smart if they were. Because if they could find where the, where the hostages were kept and it was above ground, all they would then have to do is flood the tunnels and destroy those that would be trying to hide out there. But as it is, nobody knows where the captives are. But we have been set free. Satan tried to hold on to us. Christ died. Be strong. Be courageous. There's a way out. And even if you are trapped, God has given us an avenue whereby we can come back to him in prayer and looking to that. We have hope. A hope that is sure and steadfast, one which enters within the veil. A hope, an anchor of the soul. I know I've told you about this man before, but he was a very dear friend of ours. Our sons looked up to him as kind of as a grandfather. But he was held as a prisoner in World War II. The Germans had captured him. He was on a flying run over, over Germany. Parachuted out. His parachute didn't work as well as it should have. He landed, landed hard, hurt his back. Something he'd have to deal with all his life. 
He looked for a way of escape constantly. Some took hammers to their ankles and knees. They thought if we broke ourselves up, the Germans would take pity on us. And our friends said they just put a bullet in their head. And the Germans would say, there's no escape. There was no escape. But then, in the early part of 1945, escape came in the form of the American army and set him free. And how joyous that was. There's a lot more to the story, but I won't tell you now. Other than he was so glad to be free. We get caught by the contagion of sin. Be of good courage. There is a way of escape. If you stand firm, if you stand firm, the enemy will run. That's a given. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. Just have that courage to stand. To stand. Now, look at Matthew, the fourth chapter. You can see it's verses 10 and 11. Now, what had happened? Jesus had been led up to the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. And it was sore temptation. But ultimately, Jesus got to the point where he made the final statement. And I think it's kind of fitting in light of what we talked about in class this morning. Jesus said, be gone, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him. Behold, angels came, began to minister him. What did Jesus say right there? He took a stand. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Earlier on in that whole discussion, Jesus claimed for himself deity. You shall not tempt God. He's tempting Jesus now. And so Jesus said, enough. I've had enough. He took a stand. And when he took a stand, Satan left. And it was it was intense because angels had to come and minister to Jesus. See, what Satan tried to do there Satan tried to polarize, polarize the two natures that existed conjointly in Christ. If you look at it, you'll see it. Oh, if you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. From the human side, he's big time hungry. Been fasting 40 days. From the divine side, he could have done it. He's master over nature, which he proved time and time again. He would not succumb. Throw yourself down from the the top of the citadel. If you'll bow down and worship me, all, I'll give you all that you see. Satan, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. It was not the Father who was being tempted. It was Jesus in physical form who was being tempted. God incarnate. And so what we can learn from him there, as he was like us in the flesh, he was tempted. But he stood firm. And when he did, Satan fled him, ran from him. 
and something that we can hold on to. Go back into 2 Corinthians 10th chapter. We're going to go down to verse 14. For we are not overextending ourselves. 2 Corinthians 10, 14. As if we did not reach to you. For we were the first to come, even as far as you in the gospel of Christ. So now what's he saying? We kept pressing. Paul was in, uh, in severe straits. He had been left alone in Athens. Pressed there, jumped over the Isthmus, Isthmus to Corinth by himself there, being oppressed on every side. And he said, you know what? We can overcome. And we have to stand ever so firm and resolute. So when he writes in Ephesians 6 about our, our struggles and how difficult they are, it's because of what he had written here in uh, 2 Corinthians. Go back up into verse 4 of 2 Corinthians 10. For the, uh, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses, i.e. the word of God. We have it, but we have to use it and to use it wisely. Well, close relationship with Christ is what's called for. We have not been given a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. It's what Paul wrote in his last letter. Some argue that Titus was probably last. Nevertheless, his final correspondence with young Timothy, who he viewed as his son in the faith. We don't have a spirit of timidity. You've got to rise up. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And if Christ lives in me, I can be of good courage. Why? Because I can do all things through him who strengthens me courageous and lo I'm with you always even to the end of the age so we can realize courage we can have it we can employ it we can use it but we have to first realize it's there it's ours for the taking it's ours for the utilization it's ours because well, quite honestly, because of who we are. Because of who we are. I'm glad that my never, never feared. They knew that I would be there to defend them and uphold them. And I tried to all the time. Even sometimes when I shouldn't. We heard gunshots one night. And I told the family, I said, okay, stay here. Because then shortly after the gunshots, we heard the door slam that went down into our basement. And I said, I'm going to go down and check it out. And like an egghead with a crack in it, I had no, I had no gun. I had nothing. I went down into the basement of our house and went looking through the various rooms in the basement. And then I saw the door opened that went out to our backyard. And apparently, the, whoever it was had gone through the basement looking for something and out the back door. Shortly thereafter, the police come. I live here. What are you doing down here? I heard shots. And the policeman said, are you an idiot? 
I said, well, apparently so, but my family's here. He said, you never, ever go after a man who's been shooting a gun when you have nothing to defend yourself. But you know what? I probably would do it all over again because of the need to protect the family. We have to be mindful of what's involved in courage. Spiritual courage is one thing we need to hold on to. It's all right if we're a little bit timid physically, but when one comes to spiritual, no. You need to be as tenacious and as outspoken as our dear sister in Christ, Dolores. She encourages me. Don't hide behind that Bible. I mean it. When you hear her talk, you watch her hand gestations. I mean, she's all in. And I'm so encouraged by her. We need to be all in. I would dare say Dolores wouldn't be afraid of much. She was raised by Mary. Whew. And I would say Mary wouldn't be afraid of much. We need to follow the example of others. Spiritual sense. Well, the lesson is yours this afternoon. Trust that we were able to take a little something out of the scriptures and be able to apply it to our life because we have been given every opportunity to have courage and to have strength. We just have to awaken and make the proper applications. And hopefully we will. We have a great challenge put before us at this congregation. And that is to spread the gospel to an area that has roughly 2 million people living in the valley. 2 million. I don't know where I heard that, but it shocked me. <clears throat> Not in the valley, but probably more so, yes. Because I remember the valley where there was the Browns. That was about it. That would include you too, Gay. It was the Browns and the people on uh, the real McCoys because they lived in Chatsworth. If you ever watched the program, that's where they had their farm. It was Chatsworth. No, I take that back. It wasn't Chatsworth. It was Woodland Hills. It was one of the cities in the valley. And there they grew their crops had their farms. We have a veritable cornucopia of people that we can talk to about the message of the gospel. Lesson is yours this afternoon. But if there's any that might be subject to the invitation in any way, whether it be in regards to putting Christ on in baptism or prayers for the congregation for spiritual strength, whatever we can do spiritually to help. We invite you.